have quite an array of questions here this evening. But I think one of the themes that comes through the questions is really folks wanting to know what's going on here in Boise, in both healthcare systems as well as in educational programming that's making a difference in patient safety. Several questions about black boxes, several questions about use of data to inform and in, uh, improve systems. So I would like to have each of you take a few minutes and share from your perspective what you see happening in this area to address this issue. Uh, my name is Janet Wilhouse. I work at Boise State University and I have worked for about 17 years in um, simulated healthcare settings. And as you saw in the movie, uh, it gives an opportunity for uh, health professionals and learners to practice something before they actually go and, and, and do that thing with a real patient. Um, a lot of times we're using actors, as you saw, we call those standardized patients. And um, that gives the student an opportunity to uh, have some interaction, some real communication with someone. And other times we're using the computerized mannequins or task trainers to help students learn. Um, the goal, of course, is that you would have them practice enough that they could do the skill without having to uh, think about it much when they're able to assess and talk to their patients. I have to be careful not to talk too long because this is something I'm so excited about. I can, yeah, do please. Um, Ryan Hayborn, I'm the chief medical officer at St. Alphonsus. I'm an emergency physician by background. I still see patients one day a week in an outpatient clinic. Mm -hmm. And this patient safety has come to the forefront of American healthcare. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that change in my, I graduated medical school in, in uh, 2005, so I've not been in healthcare as long as some of the other pioneers in this field or some of the other uh, leaders. But I've noticed a, a dramatic shift um, even since coming to the Treasure Valley. And I can say in my current role at St. Alphonsus, safety isn't just part of what we do, it really is the focus of what we do. And every single morning we start that conversation. Every single morning we, we gather all our leaders from the hospital, we carve out at least half an hour to go through what's going on what safety events may have taken place, what near misses may have taken place, how are we going to address those? We have safety councils. We're pursuing uh, a, becoming a high reliability organization, which is something that's not unique to healthcare, but really is focused on uh, anticipating errors, on making sure that expertise is heard wherever it comes from. There are many principles that we're trying to implement to really make safety about everything that we do. And that's not always been the case uh, you know, in healthcare in general. It wasn't a topic of conversation. It was something not only was the public not talking about, but even within healthcare, you know, we, we can't allow ourselves to think that we would ever make an error. And I can say that's changed. And uh, it takes a great deal of humility and a great deal of support for the community. And so it's very encouraging to see the amount of support that the Sheridans and others are, are giving to us in healthcare to be better. I'm a lawyer, I'm not able to offer a lot of insights as far as what's Events like this are very important, I think, to bring awareness. I mean, the Sheridan family has been phenomenal and um, still a problem. I mean, I still I probably receive inquiries from people who have had disappointments uh, with their health care. I would guess that I average probably two phone calls a day uh, during which I talk to people who want to know what their options are. And so it's a problem that needs attention. And I think it's just wonderful that it's still getting this attention. Charlie, from your perspective, has that number of calls each week declined over time? Or is, is, has the number of telephone calls that you receive gone down? I, I would say no. I, um, I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing how many, how much time I spend on the phone. Most of those inquiries don't result in cases that we accept, we, but we spend, I spend um, several hours a week just talking to people and 
helping them understand what their options are. But I, I don't see a decrease. Laura Bennett? Yep. So, I can't believe I sat next to a lawyer. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding, Joe. Uh, so, I'm a family practice doc by trade. I'm new to the teaching profession, but I'm here um, teaching at ICOM, the new medical school, first and only medical school in Idaho. Love it. We've got a great group of students. And I think what I see are, are, are several big differences compared to when I went to medical school 25 years ago, a long time ago. Um, you know, our selection process, or I think all medical schools now, they look at more than just grades. Like when I went through, all that they looked at was what's your GPA and what's your MCAT. And maybe if you did a little shadowing, that's great. But now, you know, so much of it is, are you a well-rounded person? Can you relate to people? And when we do interviews for our, our potential students, we look at all those things. And if we get a bad vibe of this person just doesn't relate well, doesn't talk well, doesn't communicate well, you know, they don't rate as high as somebody right next to them who may have a lower GPA, but they really are engaging and they can communicate well. And I think that's a key part is who are you selecting to be physicians? I think also we use the uh, simulations as well, which is really critical because when I went through, it's like you just watch somebody do it and then you did it yourself on a patient. And what a horrible way of learning. And so I think that's huge is that we do several simulated events throughout the two years that they do their academic experience. Um, and then I think we do um, uh, ITE events and professional events where we talk with and go through scenarios with nursing students, with pharmacy students. Okay, you're put in this scenario where somebody makes a mistake. How do you communicate that? And do you put blame on the person, the pharmacist, that maybe mixed the dose wrong? So they're going through all these scenarios. They're put into these scenarios that we never were. And I think, um, I think the process is definitely improving. I think there's a, a lot, yeah. Okay, <laughs> rest me question. But I think we still have a long way to go. I think even if we select you know, good students, we're trying to train them well, the process of how we do medicine, in my opinion, I ran my own business for, for 11 years, I think it's very challenging because most, um, most physicians now work in a corporate structure, and it's not point fingers at some of the bigger institutions, but you know, things are dictated to you, right? You go in, you have to see a patient, and knock, 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 in 10 minutes, time to move on to the next patient. Well, it's hard to really communicate well and listen to the patient and have a relationship with the patient when it's all about um, almost a conveyor belt of get them in, get them out, here's your drug, move on. That's not good care for the patient. And I think until that part is addressed as well, besides just picking right docs and training the docs, I, I think we're not gonna make a huge strides. So, um, yeah. Um, I, I'll, I'll be brief since I'm not local here, but I, uh, I do think that there's something I can add, which is, um, you know, I mean, I'm coming from Chicago, which is a huge, huge uh, metro metropolitan city with um, split demographics very, very clearly split. And I think we see this in Chicago a lot where the south side of Chicago has much poorer quality delivery of healthcare as the north side of Chicago. And yet, this is all happening within a seven mile radius, basically. And now we're in a state here, which is huge, um, but has a lot more uh, scarcity, I would assume, of um, access points for healthcare for smaller clinics, not as many huge hospitals. And I think you all should be very proud of how many people showed up tonight, because every person who is in this room, whether you liked the film or didn't, whether you take something away from this panel very specifically or generally, are going to be able to disseminate that information to others. That's how you get everybody engaged in patient safety. It's an awareness issue. Everybody who hears these things is immediately changed just by knowing that they exist. And uh, so I think you should all consider yourselves part of that answer to the question of what's happening in Boise patient safety, whether you've already done something or you're going to after having been here tonight. Those mics are really directional. Please almost swallow yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let me know if this is good enough. My name is Bart Hill. I'm the Chief Quality Officer with St. Luke's Health System. I'm an emergency phys physician in my past, like Brian, and I've been in an administrative role for 14 years with St. Luke. So in 2006, I took on an administrative role to have the responsibility for quality and patient safety. 
It's been my passion for 25 years to make healthcare safer because ultimately my family, my friends, myself, I'm going to be a consumer of that healthcare. <clears throat> and if it's not good enough for me, why would it be good enough for anyone else? When I think about the journey that we've been on at St. Luke's, 1999 is when the report came out to air as human. IHI, Don Berwick was leading it. He, got, he had a campaign called Get the Board on Board, and six planks, and our board got on board. Uh, A.J. Belukov, he went on trips with me to Rochester, Minnesota to see what their patient family councils were really like so that we could model that and bring that back to St. Luke's. Much like Ryan has talked about, the strategies are well known, whether it's daily safety huddles, simulation, handoff communications, the tools are there. What Berwick talked about in the film is what's missing is the will. That's where I feel we're at, is we've made progress, but not nearly enough, and not nearly fast enough. Um, so we're gonna continue to keep pushing on this agenda. Um, everything from Let's get the patient's voice heard. We shouldn't be designing new systems without the patients at the table being a part of that. Do we do it consistently 100% of the time? Not yet. But are we doing it today, whereas 14 years ago, it was a bunch of leaders around the table making decisions, not even the frontline staff who really knew what was going on, and we clearly weren't bringing the patient into the conversation. So those are the changes, some of the changes we're making, but we can get into more specifics, but it's a start, but not nearly enough. So I'm John Holmes. I am a clinical pharmacist uh, at Idaho State University, and I actually teach all sorts of health profession students. So um, one of the things that we are doing across the state, given that there is a lot of um, smaller clinics, more touch points out in rural communities, is making sure that we train the next crop of, of health professionals, whether it's a a nurse, a um, MA, a, uh, a pharmacist, a PA, a, a physician, a medical resident. And we're training everybody in the basic principles of quality improvement and patient safety. And that's a, a big task to really change that culture and include everybody into that uh, training. Um, one of my, uh, I think the other thing that Idaho State University is doing uh, very well with ICON is really that interprofessional education where we're taking uh, the medical students from ICOM, PA students, pharmacy students, nursing students, uh, speech and language, pathology students, all sorts of health professions and putting them in the same room together and really starting to break down some of those uh, discussions and uh, ensure that people are collaborative moving forward. So. Uh, Educationally, we are really focused on trying to provide the best care we can to uh, the residents of Idaho. See, this isn't it? Great. <clears throat> I just wanted to um, fill in a few blanks here. And uh, first of all, it's really gratifying for Cal and Mackenzie to meet me on the stage with our community. You know, harm did happen here in Boise. And um, it's really gratifying to see you all on stage to share what you're doing to prevent harm to other families. But I do want to I do want to share that both St. Alphonsus and St. Luke's test all of their babies for jaundice now, um, so that much I know. And um, and I also want to um, share that ICOM and BSU in their international in their um, interprofessional education they have community members help teach that class. I know that because that was me, and so I have taught both at BSU and ICOM on the importance of of uh, patient safety and working as a team and including the patient as a team member. So I just wanted to kind of fill in, I know that this is what our community is doing and I hope that they're going to continue to do more. This question is a follow-on to that, but for our two healthcare systems on the diocese, um, and it is specific to the black box question. Do black boxes, are they present collecting data within the operating uh, arenas here in Boise, Idaho? I'll take it first. Um, we do not have that. It has been briefly discussed. Uh, my recommendation at this point is that's running in the Olympics. 
And I think you have to learn to walk reliably and consistently with the basics. When the film pointed out that hand hygiene, 30 to 50 percent, it was three years ago that hand hygiene was 50 percent at St. Luke's. Before we bring in technology at this higher level, we need to do the basic things consistently and reliably. Handoff communication, we're still challenged to do it consistently and reliably. Um, I'm absolutely in favor of that, but that would be like expecting people to immediately be able to advance a really complex um, process before they really have mastered some of the basics. But I'm very supportive of it, but it, I think the timing is way premature for where my health system is today in terms of the science of safety, the understanding, the commitment, the engagement, but it should come. Absolutely, and I agree with Dr. Hill. I mean, it's a very similar perspective. Uh, there, there may be a place for that. We are taking incremental steps. I mean, one thing just to mention that is nowhere near that level, but as we talk about hand hygiene and different things that are being piloted, is we actually do have a program that we've piloted and are looking at expanding where uh, the healthcare providers, nursing, and so forth do wear uh, do wear badges that are connected through Bluetooth or wirelessly to hand wash stations, and so you can track who actually stopped here and washed their hand, who hit the pump, things like that. And so that's just you know kind of dipping our toes into that realm, but it's exciting to think what what could become of that. So there were a number of questions from the audience that really talked about engagement and how do we become engaged, more engaged in safety and being an active voice. Specifically, folks asking about are there organizations in the Treasure Valley or in Idaho that really support patient engagement or investigations of healthcare systems and I think I'd open this up to the panel member. I mean, I think, Charlie, I think you have, what's going on within the legal profession in terms of um, identifying and then reducing harm uh, when information becomes known. And, but again, really think, I think the questions are, what are the opportunities for individual engagement in the Treasure Valley in Idaho so that we can have uh, the voice of the public more engaged in the patient safety arena. The first, the first place of engagement is when you are a family member or a member or a patient within any healthcare environment, is ask those questions. Um, be willing to be assertive, um, ideally get your questions answered. Um, do not be passive when you're a family member or you're a patient. That's the first level of engagement. Additional levels are, are available if you are willing to put yourself out there and say, here's an issue and I'm willing to help get involved in addressing it. It's not uncommon that we have many opportunities identified for where we can get better. And when we approach the individual that may have been involved in that event or that near miss, they're not necessarily willing to be engaged um, to help come up with a solution. And I understand that, but it also, it loses an opportunity to really have that patient experience who actually was involved in it be part of helping to create what is the solution that ultimately is gonna be a much better solution than I think the healthcare world is gonna come up on its own. I'll add to that. I mean, just as an individual patient when we're in the healthcare system, we can't assume the healthcare system is safe because it is not. And so we have to ask all the questions that, that Dr. Hill just mentioned. We have to collect our documents. We can read our charts in the hospitals. It is our right, it is our right to collect our documents. Um, we need to be really active. We should never be in a hospital by ourselves, always have a family member. But I think on a more important level, I think as a community, you know, how do we engage our community in creating a safer healthcare system in Idaho? You know, when I worked in Washington, D.C., they call Idaho a flyover state, meaning we just didn't matter. I don't believe that. I think Idaho is small, but we can be mighty. And so I would love to see something more meaningful in Idaho. Woo! Woo! I would like to see something more meaningful in Idaho, as other states have done, such as Minnesota and Indianapolis and Pennsylvania, where they have patient safety authorities 
where it is a statewide, you know, like a task force, where there's a collaboration with, with hospitals, with the community, with medical schools, where we focus on and we're committed to patient safety. So there are great models out there in the United States, and there's no reason why Idaho cannot do the same. So actually, it's a question for you. I came from Colorado, and um, I had Copic. It was a malpractice insurance, physician-led uh, malpractice company, and they were awesome at prevention, and, and they, they gave seminars. It was really a great company to work with, but they did this program called Three R's, and if I remember the three R's, I think it was recognize, respond, and repair, if I recall correctly. It was a voluntary program for physicians, and the concept was, if you signed up for this, you agree that if you either make a mistake or recognize a potential bad outcome, even if you did things correctly, you notified Copic, they would contact the patient, and then what would happen is they would ask the patient, do you have any extra costs? Did you lose time from work? Do you have you know, extra medical expenses? They would cover those, but they would also find out what happened. So what happened? Why, you know, was there something the physician could have done differently? Was communication a problem? And they would give that information back to the rest of the Copic physician community. So it was a great way to, A, minimize malpractice costs, but B, also take care of the patient because, and you were also allowed to tell the patient, I made a mistake, I'm sorry. And what a great idea. I was like, wow, this is a phenomenal idea. We should all be doing this. We learn from the mistakes. It's an open way of figuring out what we did wrong. The patient's concerns are taken care of. And I just thought it was awesome. I don't know if they're doing anything like that here in Idaho. Uh, well, Charlie, you can add to this too, but I just want to share that what you're talking about is, is actually ha happening nationally. And in both Cal and Pat's case, we were not told of the errors. So it sent us on a very painful, long journey where we had to figure out the errors on our own. And that's unacceptable. And there are programs, national programs, it's called CANDOR, um, that there are many hospitals across the nation now being trained on this very approach where patients are immediately told about the error. They work together, they create new policies, like Bart said. They work with the family. They take care of the family's needs. And, and then there's a learning in the, there's a, a you know, continuous learning in the system. So we actually have an expert audience on Candor if you ever want to ask Marty Catley wherever you are. But that's something I would like to see training in this state in our healthcare systems. Yeah, I, I would say this. Most people who I meet with who have had a disappointment with their healthcare, um, if they get to my office, the first thing they want to tell me is, never ever envisioned myself sitting in a lawyer's office talking about a subject like this. Um, and I think most of the time they're in my office because they just need someone to talk to. And they either haven't felt comfortable sitting down with the, the doctor or the hospital representative, um, and so haven't taken that step which I often encourage them to take to see if, if that can be productive. Um, but they really just want to tell their story to someone. And so I think the program that, that Laura described really is a, a program that's on the right track. Because I think while it may be counterintuitive for a doctor to acknowledge an error or engage the patient and, and acknowledge shortcomings in their care, it would save me a lot of time talking to people because they just want someone to talk to, to talk it out. They don't want to sue, sue them. That's the rare situation. They just need an audience and need to understand how it happened and what can be done to prevent it from happening to someone else. Mike, do you have anything to add from your visits to other states about organizations, movements that are taking place to support the patient safety initiative? Yeah, there's, um, I've been made aware of a group called Greater National Advocates, which is now localizing to certain states and cities. Um, and you can look them up, as well as I think just in general. Use the internet to your advantage here. Uh, there are a lot of groups that aren't well known, but are very effective that can provide um, people, not just resources, but people to join you in your healthcare experience so that you uh, aren't alone. And not everybody does have a family member readily accessible to join them. 
And I, I think that's your first step, somebody who's familiar with you, but that's not always the case. And a, an advocate is a professional person who understands the system and they understand people in a way that they can communicate before you have to talk to a doctor or a nurse. Um, and that's a, a movement that is happening in a way of sort of organizing patient advocacy at the grassroots level um, and using experienced individuals. Uh, but in general, there are a lot of resources out there too for people to access. And AHRQ is a great place, but it's just not very like consumer friendly. Uh, it, you know, it's, it, it's hard to navigate, but, um, it, but they have a lot of great resources. And I think it's a great place to start to look at what some of those things are that you can be on the lookout for when you go into the healthcare system as a patient. Um, but some, are, some really good examples, I mean, one's right next door to you guys. I think Utah's next door. Um, sorry. Um, Intermountain Healthcare has a fantastic uh, patient safety track record growing um, where they have really like put front and center those efforts. They are putting um, like huge life size printouts of people, of like nurses and doctors who have done certain things and making them into superheroes on the wall because of their patient safety success stories. They're putting stories up on the walls. They're making it very known to people that. Yes, we make mistakes, but we also save the day. And everybody should be looking for these save the day moments. And, and if you're in a hospital that doesn't highlight uh, those things, and a lot of them call, are called good catches. The good catch program is one that's taking off nationwide. It's, it's the kind of stuff you should be on the lookout for. Um, this isn't something that's in the dark for any hospital system. And if they can open up and share with you their success stories, then they're most likely putting in the legwork. And the effort to uh, to continue to improve. Thank you. I must say I'm really impressed with the diversity of the questions that the audience has. And one, there's been a number of questions that are talking about um, populations that are marginalized in our society and what's being done within educational session settings, as well as in healthcare delivery systems to assure that we are providing quality of care to every individual who comes across um, in need. So I, for the educators and the healthcare providers on this panel, what are, what's going on within your arenas to help assure um, a quality of care and quality standards of equal access and uh, equal quality for all? So, so I can start with that. Um, so I'm in a medical residency program at Idaho State University in Pocatello. So at a very basic level, our clinic is a federally qualified community health center which serves or acts as a safety net. And it serves as, um, as a safety net for people that don't have insurance or are underinsured or are um, generally the uh, patients that just cannot access uh, healthcare like many others could. Um, and in that clinic, we have every type of learner. And we, um, you know, we have nursing students, pharmacy students, uh, medical students, uh, PA students that come through there and, and are exposed to all of that and see the, um, you know, the, the problems that people face. Uh, the real world problems, not the textbook problems. Um, I, I'll go back to the interprofessional education stuff that we do. Um, with ICOM, um, many of our cases um, highlight those exact issues. P patients that either don't have insurance, patients that um, are having trouble navigating the healthcare system, um, and we talk through those issues. Um, and so I think, I think there's definitely more that could be done, um, but I think it's recognizing that that's something that needs to occur, and that's starting. So uh, these for the nursing programs, um, it is a requirement that all nurses learn about policy and how to be policy makers. And probably one of the most important things that nurses can do is talk to their elected officials and to talk to the people who make policy. And that is one of the best things that we can do to help the unempowered Become more empowered. 
Well, within the healthcare systems, the first step is assuring that the workforce has an appreciation for the cultural diversity of the community that they live in and that they serve. Um, I would say that it, it, again, has started, but it needs to be improved. The access was mentioned, and this is a very legitimate concern as Idaho is growing so rapidly as being able to provide adequate access as a not-for-profit health system, as is St. Alphonsus, nobody's refused care. There's not a there's not an insurance biopsy when someone calls to make an appointment. However, care can be unaffordable regardless, and that often is a deterrent to people. So it's addressing what ways can we support people um, so that they get the care that they need. We know that if we don't provide the preventative care, it eventually it's going to be very expensive care and rescue care. So our commitment is we need to make preventative care available, whether it's through telemedicine, um, other resources. It isn't going to be feasible to build clinics in every place, but our, our vision is that we would provide care close to home. Because if, it's, if that's a barrier, people are not going to access it. For the populations that can be marginalized, it's understanding what are their social factors, what are the social determinants, because we are becoming increasingly aware of how that does drive the outcomes in healthcare. So we know that getting medications is an issue. Uh, medication assistant teams are in place. They have, in the course of about a year, saved a million dollars in out-of-pocket costs for people who otherwise couldn't get medications by finding programs either from the pharmaceuticals themselves or other options where their medicines can be uh, obtained either free or reduced cost. We also know that it, being compliant with medications is more important than whether we're reimbursed. Setting up a program where you have medications at the time of discharge so you're not then having a barrier to get to a pharmacy and whether or not you get sticker shock and can afford it. So there's, there's still tremendous opportunities. Um, the interpretive services, uh, it's a legal requirement, but make it as user-friendly as possible so that people do not try to interpret if you have a limited grasp of another language. Get an expert so that you can really connect to that family, to that patient, and truly understand who they are and where they're coming from. Laura's point is legitimate. This is not something you can do on a production line and churn out a certain number of volume every single day. You have to approach each patient uniquely and give them the time and attention that is necessary for the problems that they're coming to you with. I would just echo that, you know, we are very fortunate in Boise to have two large health systems that are unified in so many of these initiatives. Uh, and, uh, you know, especially something at the forefront of many of our minds appropriately is our asylum seekers. Something I'm very proud of being in this community is that uh, we are home to many of uh, those individuals and we've built an international clinic and trying to increase awareness and access for those individuals from all over the world who speak so many different languages and trying to establish those resources. It's really something I'm proud of, not just for my health system, but that we're trying to do as a whole community. So, Dr. Raybould, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that uh, you know, in Boise, there are two primary major health systems. Several questions ask very specifically, what are we, what are those two systems doing together as partners and outside of their silos to um, assure and enhance uh, patient safety? Well, there are, there are a lot of things that have happened that are continuing to happen. We're, we're members on multiple councils within the community. One that we're both participating in pretty actively is around uh, opioid utilization, opioid appropriate utilization, opioid reduction, uh, where appropriate. And uh, communicating with one another all the time. As I was just in the, in the uh, foyer talking with Dr. Hill a little, we were talking about a meeting that we have upcoming where our two health systems are gonna come together. Just uh, you know, a few of us that talk about uh, how we facilitate transfers, how we complement each other's services in the, in, in the best way possible. Uh, and those relationships are very, very important to both of us. As with everything we've shared up here today, opportunities exist. And we're still trying to explore those opportunities. I've not been in my role for a, for a long period of time, and so I'm still 
uh, coming up to speed on some of those, but they exist, and I can absolutely say without hesitation, the desire is there to be collaborative. Uh, to build upon that, St. Alphonsus for years has had a premier uh, trauma program, and St. Luke's over a number of years has had a children's hospital. Well, children's trauma is not the same as adult trauma, and uh, the decision was made that we, as a children's hospital, should be able to provide care for children who are involved in traumatic injuries. Well, that easily could have been a significant threat to St. Alphonsus, who has had, again, a wonderful adult trauma program and children's program, but they would initially stabilize children, and then they would transfer them to St. Luke's, and if the family was involved in the accident, the parents stayed there, and the kids were cared for at St. Luke's. Not an ideal situation where you split the family apart. Or even the fact that you have to transfer from one facility to another partway through their trauma care. The St. Alphonsus has been wonderful in supporting our drive to provide better uh, trauma care for children by developing a certified uh, pediatric trauma program. That's one example, and that's gonna pay dividends in better outcomes, safer care for every child in the community who needs as uh, an unfortunate uh, need for trauma care. Um, as Ryan said, there's still plenty of opportunities. There are also sometimes limitations. Um, as much as you would like to connect and share, and uh, sometimes there are administrative rules, which there are plenty of those, to get in the way, then it causes um, at least other leaders, the legal team and others, to get pretty nervous about what are we talking about. Um, I know that I, for years, had relationships with Dr. Bob Pope, who was uh, in a predecessor of Ryan in that role. And together, uh, we would share, and we still do share, when a patient has a safety event at one facility and happens to get care at another, let them know. This was our experience. You may want to take a look, see what opportunities for improvement may exist. So things like that happen every single day, but there certainly are more opportunities where we can collaborate together on safety. I'd like to um, <clears throat> maybe issue a challenge um, to St. Al's and St. Luke's to, you know, really think about this relationship and learning from each other. You know, it, it, this was, you know, when Cal was born a long time ago, but you know, when Cal was um, received unsafe care in one hospital, the other hospital didn't know about it. And so it, it was hard for me to understand how something could two and a half miles apart, and like when Cal was born, at St. Luke's, and then two and a half years later, I had McKenzie, and when I had McKenzie at St. Ailes, they had no idea about Cal's um, experience with jaundice, and that, that was alarming to me, that in our own community, there was no learning. And so what I had mentioned about like the, the, the task force, the, the patient safety authorities in other states, there's actually a list of something called never events, things that should never happen in the healthcare system. And these were very well thought about, Kernicterus was one of those uh, never events, so these state hospitals report never events, and they work on safety issues together to prevent never events. So I would love to see something more robust and some kind of relationship and partnership to ensure that never events don't happen in Idaho. I think the evidence of partnership is very positive. I guess I would like to call out um, our universities as well to be an active player in supporting um, an organization or a system like the CANDOR, which it is, you know, communication and optimal resolution cultures. How can we as educational institutions also support the systems as you move forward? So I wanted to share the opportunity to grow this valley and the state of Idaho together. Uh, so again, I, I, I think the challenge is well given, Sue, and I think we all play a role in being active players there. Well, there are many, many more questions, <laughs> many, many more, um, which I think does serve as the testament to the interest and the level of um, commitment and hopefully we've stimulated some thought and where we might, uh, where we look to the future to build something better together. Um, Mike, do you have anything, I'm gonna let Sue close the panel discussion, but uh, Mike, is there anything you'd like to add from your experiences in other communities? Um, well, I, I, I'm really glad that Sue just uh, made that 
call to action. I do think that one of the, the having now been to so many different places with the film, the, the most frustrating thing is, is the lack of inter-community communication. You know, it, 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 it's, it's one thing to look at the nation as a whole and to say um, that, you know, there is a great resource in D.C., HRQ, that's disseminating information, and it's up to the hospitals to decide whether they want to engage with that information or they can. And then it's another thing to say that, you know, you go to Boston and there's three major hospitals all in the same, like, basically, like, three block radius doing incredible, like, game-changing work on patient safety, and that information gets published in a white paper and then just gets drowned. I mean, you know, you hear, you hear the doctors and nurses and people, they, the hospital, they get white papers every day and, and there, there are dozens of pages, like, you can't get through all that information. And healthcare research is moving at a lightning fast pace, but the dissemination of that, it's, it's overwhelming for the people in healthcare. So we really do have to find a way at a more local level, because right now we just can't trust our, our nation as a whole to do this, or the government to do this. We have to think at a local level of how to retrieve the information that is most applicable to our communities and get it in the right hands. And I do think a part of that is making sure that the leaders of the healthcare systems and the healthcare organizations are talking to each other and learning from each other, not just from never events, not just from things that happen, but from the things that the rest of the country is already doing or learning from. That's, that was our main goal with this film. We could have made a movie that was, you know, way more of an expose and entertaining and maybe gets us into film festivals and is exciting as a filmmakers, but it wouldn't have made the difference that I think that this film can make, which is to inspire people to do more action and to look at what's happening in Canada. They're doing something. And you can have that conversation. I think you make a great point. I mean, not every hospital system is ready to put black box systems inside of their surgical theaters. It's, it, it is a very complex change, and it, it, it's difficult. Um, but being aware that it exists and being aware that it's not just a tool to catch, doc, catch surgeons making a mistake, it's actually a tool to learn from the strengths and the weaknesses of what's happening in that room so that you can improve upon those. Well, if you don't have a a uh, black box right now, how do we get the information that the people who have a black box in their surgical rooms are learning so that the people who don't can then start to implement that information? Like, it shouldn't cost everybody a hundred million dollars to get better at patient safety. So, that's kind of the end there. Thank you. Um, by the film. <laughs> Well, I, I asked to close this session because a lot of times <clears throat> at screenings or just talking about patient safety with my family, um, my late husband, Pat, a lot of people wonder really what was, you know, he doesn't, there's not a whole lot about Pat on here. And I want to share that when um, Pat was struggling to um, survive his medical heir when they lost his pathology, um, he got care, um, his care was not here in Idaho, um, the heirs, but um, both St. Ailes and St. Luke's cared for, for Pat during that time where he struggled to live, and so I am thankful to both the healthcare systems here. Um, but one morning, uh, Pat woke up here in Boise and he was paralyzed from his waist down. And this was about two and a half years after his air, and we thought he had had a stroke, and we um, airlifted him to um, uh, MD Anderson in Houston. And we were told there that uh, we thought for a while that Pat was going to live, and we learned then that um, he had about 10 days to live. And um, many of the family members were there, Pat's mom, Phyllis was there with me, and Pat had always told me that he, if he was going to die from his cancer, that he wanted to die on a boat with all of his friends and family and a bunch of really expensive wine. <laughs> so we were in Houston, and so after we collected ourselves, I said, darling, we're by water, I'm gonna fly our friends and family down here. And Pat got really quiet and he, the Mackenzie was four and Cal was six and we had never been to Disney World together. So Pat looked at me and by this time he was paralyzed from his neck down. And he said, Sue, he said, I wanna to go to Disney World and watch my friends and family have the time of their lives. 
So the healthcare professionals at MD Anderson really mobilized. They started making phone calls, they were getting everything that Pat needed. They sent to palliative care to talk with, with me about the kids. And um, within four days, uh, 53 of us were in Orlando at Disney. And um, so we, we made it there. And um, we were told by the CEO of Disney who welcomed us that nobody died at Disney World. And, uh, but they put the kids in the parades, and um, they sent up Minnie, Mickey, and Pluto, and it was really, I mean, Pat really scripted his last chapter. And he gathered all 53 of us, and he made us all promise him that we would stay um, if he died there. And um, we, as you can imagine, we had precious conversations during that time and um, about what I was gonna do as a single mom. And the kids were at, Animal Kingdom and family were all over the park and um, Pat did die on the third day. And during that time, you know, he, he, he was funny to the very end. He did drink straw, wine through a straw, um, expensive wine. And, um, but he looked at me and my maiden name was Brown. And he always called me Brown and he looked at me and he said, Brown, and we we're talking about what I was gonna do as a single mom. He said, Brown, whatever you do, he said, do not give up on patience. So as you can imagine, that's been seared in my soul. And so I ask this panel, never give up on patient safety and make this a priority at your institution and in this state. And for the audience, never give up on patient safety and be proactive and take care of your family members. And so I'm channeling Pat's message to all of you. It was, um, you know, it was his anniversary on Sunday of 18, 18 years ago when he died. So I felt compelled to close this and send a message from him to you and to this panel. So thank you.